Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air as President Biden is about to hold an event at the White House to celebrate the historic confirmation of Ketanji Brown Jackson, soon to be the nation's first black female justice on the Supreme Court. Any minute, we'll hear from the president, the vice president, and then Judge Jackson herself will speak to the supporters and lawmakers and family members who have gathered there on the South Lawn. This comes a day after the Senate's 53 to 47 vote to confirm her, three Republicans joining all 50 members of the Democratic caucus. Judge Jackson will take office once the court's current term ends in late June or early July. Let's get right to NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker, who is on the lawn for the event. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Ali. You can feel how momentous this moment is with hundreds of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's supporters gathered here on the South Lawn for this commemoration of her confirmation. This is historic. She will become the first black female justice on the Supreme Court. This is historic for other reasons as well, Hallie, because this is is the first time in history that the high court will not be a majority of white men. It will now have two black justices and four women justices. So this is a monumental day indeed in terms of who we expect to be here in the audience who are seated right now. Uh, it includes dozens of those 53 senators who voted to confirm her. As you mentioned, there were three Republicans who voted in favor of her as well. They are not in attendance. Susan Collins is recovering from from COVID. Lisa Murkowski is in her home state of Alaska, and Senator Mitt Romney has decided not to attend. But there are plenty of people here to support her, including her family. I just saw her husband and two daughters walk in, and you can really see the pride, and you can see the emotion in their faces, Hallie. And of course, we all saw that image yesterday of the president and Judge Jackson watching that vote to confirm her. They embraced afterwards, and I am told by those in the room, that it was an incredibly emotional moment for both of them. This was, of course, not an easy road to confirmation. We all witnessed those confirmation hearings. They became quite heated at times. Some of her Republican critics challenging her about whether she's too soft on crime. Her supporters say she handled those heated moments with grace and with fortitude. Hallie. Kristen Welker, as we hear those bars behind us, signaling the president is about to walk out. An important Ladies day, of course, personally for Judge States, Jackson, accompanied but also politically for President Biden States, and for Vice President Judge Harris, Ketanji who are celebrating this moment, a bipartisan confirmation of President Biden's Supreme Court pick as he now heads out alongside. We expect to see him there, flanked by Vice President Harris and Judge Jackson. I want to quickly get to Yamish Alcindor, our Washington correspondent. And Yamish, a big moment for the president here in the couple seconds we have. A profound moment for the president, a profound moment for this nation. Um, the president made this promise to, to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court, and Ketanji Brown Jackson's friends say she was the person that was destined to be here, that she is perfect for this because of her judicial temperament, but also because she's someone who understands both the perspective of African Americans, but who can also be fair when she's on the bench. They called her brilliant and a star, and they are there celebrating with her today as the nation celebrates as well. She was with the president as that confirmation vote happened. You could see the emotion on all of their faces as we prepare to watch Good this morning. victory lap at the White Good House. Morning. Let's listen in. <laughs> Good morning, America. <laughs> Have a seat, please. President Joe Biden, First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, Second Gentleman, Douglas Emhoff, members of Congress, members of the Cabinet, members of our administration, and friends and fellow Americans, today is indeed a wonderful day. As we gather to celebrate, the confirmation of the next justice of the United States Supreme Court, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. President George Washington once referred to America 
as a great experiment, a nation founded on the previously untested belief that the people, we the people, could form a more perfect union. And that belief has pushed our nation forward for generations. And it is that belief that we reaffirmed yesterday. <laughs> Through the confirmation of the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court. And Judge Jackson, you will inspire generations of leaders. They will watch your confirmation hearings and read your decisions. In the years to come, the court will answer fundamental questions about who we are and what kind of country we live in. Will we? expand opportunity or restrict it? Will we strengthen the foundations of our great democracy or let them crumble? Will we move forward or backward? The young leaders of our nation will learn from the experience, the judgment, the wisdom that you, Judge Jackson, will apply in every case that comes before you. And they will see, for the first time, four women sitting on that court at one time. So as, as a point of personal privilege, I will share with you, Judge Jackson, that when I presided over the Senate confirmation vote yesterday, while I was sitting there, I drafted a note to my goddaughter. And I told her that I felt such a deep sense of pride and joy, and about what this moment means for our nation and for her future. And I will tell you, her braids are just a little longer than yours. <laughs> But as I wrote to her, I told her what I knew this would mean for her life and all that she has in terms of potential. So indeed, the road toward our more perfect union is not always straight, and it is not always smooth. But sometimes it leads to a day like today. A day that reminds us what is possible, what is possible when progress is made, and that the journey, well, it will always be worth it. So let us not forget that as we celebrate this day, we are also here in great part because of one President Joe Biden. commitment, a lifelong commitment to building a better America. And of course, we are also here because of the voices and the support of so many others, many of whom are in this audience today. And with that, it is now my extreme and great honor to introduce our president, Joe Biden. Thank you, Kamala. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
the first really smart decision I made in this administration. <laughs> My name is Joe Biden. Please sit down. I'm Jill's husband <laughs> and Naomi Biden's grandfather. And, uh, folks, uh, now, yesterday, uh, th this is not only a sunny day. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This is going to let so much shine, sun shine on so many young women, so many young black women, so many minorities, that it's real. It's real. We're going to look back, nothing to do with me. We're going to look back and see this as a moment of real change in American history. I was on the phone this morning, Jesse, with President Ramaphosa of South Africa. And he was talking about how the time that I was so outspoken about what was going on in my meeting with Nelson Mandela here. And I said, you know, I said, I'm shortly going to go out, look, I'm looking out the window. I'm going to go out on this, what they call the South Lawn in the White House. And I'm going to introduce to the world, to the world, the first African-American woman out of over 200 judges on the Supreme Court. And he said to me, he said, keep it up. Keep it up. We're going to keep it up. And folks, yesterday, we all witnessed a truly historic moment presided over by the Vice President. There are moments that people go back in history, and they're literally historic, consequential, fundamental shifts in American policy. Today, we're joined by the First Lady, the Second Gentleman, and members of the Cabinet, Senate Majority Leader. We're, there you are, Chuck. Senate Majority Leader. And so many who made this possible. But — and today is a good day, a day uh, that history is going to remember. And in the years to come, they're going to be proud of what we did. And we're going to tell what Dick Durbin did as the chairman of the committee. <laughs> I'm serious, Dick. I'm deadly earnest when I say that. To turn our children and grandchildren to say, I was there. I was there. That's, this is one of those moments, in my view. My fellow Americans today, I'm honored to officially introduce to you the next Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Katanji Brown Jackson. After more than 20 hours of questioning at her hearing and nearly 100 meetings, she made herself available to every single senator who wanted to speak to her and spoke for more than just a few minutes, answered their questions in private as well as before the committee. We all saw the kind of justice she'll be, fair and impartial, thoughtful, careful, precise, brilliant, a brilliant legal mind with deep knowledge of the law and a judicial temperament, which was equally important in my view, that's calm and in command, and a humility that allows so many Americans to see themselves in Katanji Brown Jackson. That brings a rare combination of expertise and qualifications to the court. A federal judge who has served on the second most powerful court in America, behind the Supreme Court. A former federal public defender, with the, with the ability to explain complicated issues in the law in ways everybody, all people, can understand, a new perspective. When I made the commitment to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court, I could see this day. I literally could see this day, because I thought about it for a long, long time. As Jill and Naomi will tell you, I wasn't going to run again. But when I decided to run, this was one of the first decisions I made. I could see it. I could see it as a day of hope, a day of promise, a day of progress, a day when, once again, the moral arc of the universe, as Barack used to quote all the time, bends a little more toward justice. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I knew the person I nominated would be put through a painful and difficult confirmation process. But I have to tell you, what Judge Jackson was put through was well beyond that. There was verbal abuse, the anger, the constant interruptions, the most vile, baseless assertions and accusations. 
In the face of it all, Judge Jackson showed the incredible character and integrity she possesses. Poise. Poise and composure. Patience and restraint. And yes, perseverance and even joy. Even joy. Tanji, or I can't, I'm not going to be calling you that in public anymore. <laughs> Judge, you are the very definition of what we Irish refer to as dignity. You have enormous dignity. And it communicates to people. It's contagious. And it matters. It matters a lot. Maybe that's not surprising if you look to uh, sat behind her during those hearings. Her husband, Dr. Patrick Jackson, and his family. Patrick, stand up, man. Stand up. Talia and Layla, stand up. I know it's embarrassing the girls. I'm going to tell you what Talia said. I said to Talia, it's hard being the daughter or the son of a famous person. I said, imagine what it's like being president. He said, she said, she may be. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kataj, her brother, a former police officer and a veteran. Kataj, stand up, man. This is a man who looks like he can still play, buddy. He's got biceps about as big as my calves. Thank you, bud. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, her parents, Johnny and Elroy Brown. Johnny, all right, stand up. I'll tell you what, as I told mom, mom's rule in my house. <laughs> oh, you're not think I'm kidding. I'm not. My mom and my wife as well. Look, people of deep faith, the deep love of family and country, that's what you represent. Who know firsthand, mom and dad, the indignity of Jim Crow, the inhumanity of legal segregation. And you had overcome so much in your own lives. You saw the strength of parents and the strength of a daughter that is just worth celebrating. I can't get over mom and dad, you know, I mean, what, what you did and your faith and never giving up any hope in both that wonderful son you have and your daughter. You know, and that strength lifted up millions of Americans who watched you, Judge Jackson, especially women and women of color, who have had to run the gauntlet in their own lives. So many of my cabinet members are women, women of color, women that represent every sector of the community. And it matters. And you stood up for them as well. They know it. Everybody out there, every woman out there, everyone, am I correct? <laughs> Just like they have. Just like they have. And same with the women members of Congress as well, across the board. Look, it's a powerful thing when people can see themselves in others. Think about that. What's the most powerful thing? I'll bet every one of you can go back and think of a time in your life where there was a teacher, a family member, a neighbor, somebody, somebody who made you believe that you could be whatever you wanted to be. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful notion. That's one of the reasons I believe so strongly that we needed a court that looks like America, not just the Supreme Court. That's why I'm proud to say, with the great help of Dick Durbin, I've nominated more black women judges of federal appeal courts than all previous presidents combined. Combined. That's why I'm proud that Kamala Harris is our Vice President of the United States. A brilliant lawyer, the Attorney General of the State of California, former member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Kamala was invaluable during this entire process.
And Chuck, our majority leader, I want to thank you, pal. You did a massive job in keeping the caucus together, getting this vote across the finish line in a timely and historic manner. Just watching on television yesterday, watching when the vote was taken and the Democratic side, the brave people, there was such enthusiasm, genuine. You can tell when it's real. You can tell when it's real. Did an incredible job, Chuck. Thank you so much. Folks. Because you're all able to sit down and don't have to stand, I'm going to go on a little longer here and tell you. <laughs> I want to say something about Dick Durbin again. Dick, I'm telling you, overseeing the hearing, how you executed the strategy by the hour, every day, to keep the committee together. And you have a very divided committee with some of the most conservative members of the Senate on that committee. It was especially difficult with an evenly divided Senate. Dick, I, I served as chairman of that committee for a number of years before I had this job and the job of vice president, as did uh, all the Democrats. You did not stand. I think all the Democrats in the committee did, and uh, every Democrat in the Senate, all of whom voted for Judge Jackson. And notwithstanding the harassment and attacks in the hearings, I always believed that the bipartisan vote was possible. And I hope I don't get him in trouble. I mean it sincerely, but I want to thank three Republicans who voted for Judge Jackson. <laughs> Senator Collins is a woman of integrity. <laughs> Senator Murkowski, the same way in Alaska and up for re-election. And Mitt Romney, whose dad stood up like he did. His dad stood up and made these decisions on civil rights. They deserve enormous credit for setting aside partnership and making a carefully considered judgment based on the judge's character, qualifications, independence. And I truly admire the respect, diligence, and hard work they demonstrated in the course of the process. As someone who's overseen, they tell me, more Supreme Court nominations than anyone who's alive today, I believe that respect for the process is important. And that's why it was so important to me to meet the constitutional requirement to seek the advice and the consent of the Senate, the advice beforehand and the consent. Judge Jackson started the nominating process with an, impre an impressive range of support, from the FOP to the civil rights leaders. Even Republican-appointed judges came forward. In fact, Judge Jackson was introduced to the hearing by Judge Thomas Griffin, the distinguished retired judge appointed by George W. Bush. She finished the hearing with among the highest levels of support of the American people of any nomination in recent memory. So soon, Judge Jackson will join the United States Supreme Court. And like every justice, the decisions she makes will impact on the lives of America for a lot longer, in many cases, than any laws we all make. But the truth is, she's already impacting the lives of so many Americans. During the hearing, Dick spoke about a custodial worker who works the night shift at the Capitol. Her name is Verona Clemens. Verona, where are you? Stand up, Verona. I wanted to see you. You don't mind. She told him what this nomination meant to her. So he invited Ms. Clemens to attend the hearing because she wanted to see, hear, and stand by Judge Jackson. Thank you, Verona. She thank you, thank you, thank you. At her meeting with Judge Jackson, Senator Duckworth introduced her to 11-year-old, is it Vivian? Vivian. Vivian. I'm sorry, Vivian. There's, that's her. Is that your sister? He's pointing. <laughs> Who is so inspired by the hearing, she wants to be a Supreme Court justice when she grows up. God love you. Stand up, honey. Am I going to embarrass you by asking you to stand up? Come on, stand. There's tens of thousands of veins all through the entire United States. She met Judge Jackson and saw her future. It means you're here today, and thank you for coming, honey. I know I embarrassed you by introducing you, but thank you. People of every generation, of every race, of every background felt this moment, and they feel it now. They feel a sense of pride and hope and belonging and believing and knowing the promise of America includes everybody, all of us. That's the American experiment. Justice Breyer talked about it when he came to the White House in January to announce his retirement 
from the court. He used to technically work with me when I was on the Judiciary Committee, and that's before he became a justice. He's a man of great integrity. We're going to miss Justice Breyer. He's a patriot, an extraordinary public service, and a great justice of the Supreme Court. And, folks, <laughs> let me close with what I've long said. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot, uh, foot, foot, excuse me, the foothills of the Himalayas with Xi Jinping, traveling with him. I guess we traveled 17,000 miles when I was vice president. I don't know that for a fact. And uh, we were sitting alone. I had an interpreter, and he had an interpreter. And he looked at me in all seriousness. He said, can you define America for me? And I said what many of you heard me say for a long time. I said, yes, I can. In one word, possibilities. Possibilities. That in America, everyone should be able to go as far as their hard work and God-given talent will take them. And possibilities, we're the only ones. That's why we're viewed as the ugly Americans. We think anything's possible. <laughs> and the idea that a young girl who was dissuaded from even thinking you should apply to Harvard Law School. <laughs> don't raise your hopes so high. Well, I don't know who told you that, but I'd like to go back and invite her to the Supreme Court. She can see the interior. <laughs> Look, even the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Now, folks, it's my honor, and it truly is an honor, I've been looking forward to it for a while, to introduce you the next Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable Katanji Brown Jackson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President. It is the greatest honor of my life to be here with you at this moment, standing before my wonderful family, many of my close friends, your distinguished staff and guests, and the American people. Over these past few weeks, you've heard a lot from me and about me. So I hope to use this time primarily to do something that I have not had sufficient time to do, which is to extend my heartfelt thanks to the many, many people who have helped me as part of this incredible journey. I have quite a few people to thank, and, and as I'm sure you can imagine, in this moment, it is hard to find the words to express the depth of my gratitude. First, as always, I have to give thanks to God for delivering me as promised and for sustaining me throughout this nomination and confirmation process. As I said at the outset, I have come this far by faith, and I know that I am truly blessed to the many people who have lifted me up in prayer since the nomination, thank you. I am very grateful. Thank you as well, Mr. President, for believing in me and for honoring me with this extraordinary chance to serve our country. Thank you also, M Madam Vice President, for your wise counsel and steady guidance. And thank you to the First Lady and the Second Gentleman for the care and warmth that you have shown me and my family. I would also like to extend my thanks to each member of the Senate. You have fulfilled the important constitutional role of providing advice and consent under the leadership of Majority Leader Schumer. And I'm ex especially grateful for the work of the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee under Chairman Durbin's skillful leadership. As you may have heard, during the confirmation process, I had the distinct honor 
of having 95 personal meetings with 97 sitting senators. <laughs> and we had substantive and engaging conversations about my approach to judging and about the role of judges in the constitutional system we all love. As a brief aside, I will note that these are subjects about which I care deeply. I have dedicated my career to public service because I love this country and our Constitution and the rights that make us free. I also understand from my many years of practice as a legal advocate, as a trial judge, and as a judge on a court of appeals, that part of the genius of the constitutional framework of the United States is its design and that the framers entrusted the judicial branch with the crucial but limited role. I've also spent the better part of the past decade hearing thousands of cases and writing hundreds of opinions. And in every instance, I have done my level best to stay in my lane and to reach a result that is consistent with my understanding of the law and with the obligation to rule independently without fear or favor. I am humbled and honored to continue in this fashion as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, working with brilliant colleagues, supporting and defending the Constitution, and steadfastly upholding the rule of law. But today, at this podium, my mission is far more modest. I am simply here to give my heartfelt thanks to the categories of folks who are largely responsible for me being here at this moment. First, of course, there is my family. Mom and Dad, thank you, not only for traveling back here on what seems like a moment's notice, but for everything you've done and continue to do for me. My brother Kataj is here as well. You've always been an inspiration to me as a model of public service and bravery, and I thank you for that. I love you all very much. <laughs> to my in-laws, Pamela and Gardner Jackson, who are here today, and my sisters-in-law and brothers-in-law, William and Dana, Gardy and Natalie, thank you for your love and support. To my daughters, Talia and Layla, I bet you never thought you'd get to skip school by spending a day at the White House. <laughs> this is all pretty exciting for me as well, but nothing has brought me greater joy than being your mother. I love you very much. Patrick, thank you for everything you've done for me over these past 25 years of our marriage. You've done everything to support and encourage me, and it is you who've made this moment possible. Your, your steadfast love gave me the courage to move in this direction. I, I don't know that I believed you when you said that I could do this, but now I do. <laughs> And for that, I'm forever grateful. In the family category, let me also briefly mention the huge extended family, both Patrick's and my own, who are watching this from all over the country and the world. Thank you for supporting me. I hope to be able to connect with you personally in the coming weeks and months. Moving on briefly to the second category of people that warrant special recognition, those who provided invaluable support to me professionally in the decades prior to my nomination, and the many, many friends I have been privileged to make throughout my life and career. Now, I know that everyone who finds professional success thinks they have the best mentors, but I truly do. <laughs> I had three inspiring jurists for whom I had the privilege of clerking, Judge Patty Saris, Judge Bruce Selya, and of course, Justice Stephen Breyer. Each of them is an exceptional public servant and I could not have had better role models for thoughtfulness, integrity, honor, and principle, both by word and deed. My clerkship with Justice Breyer in particular was an extraordinary gift, 
and one for which I've only become more grateful with each passing year. Justice Breyer's commitment to an independent, impartial judiciary is unflagging. And for him, the rule of law is not merely a duty, it is his passion. I am daunted by the prospect of having to follow in his footsteps, and I would count myself lucky, indeed, to be able to do so with even the smallest amount of his wisdom, grace, and joy. The exceptional mentorship of the judges for whom I clerked has proven especially significant for me during this past decade of my service as a federal judge. And of course, that service itself has been a unique opportunity. For that, I must also thank President Obama, who put his faith in me by nominating me to my first judicial role on the federal district court. This brings me to my colleagues and staff of the Federal District Court in Washington, D.C. and the D.C. Circuit. Thank you for everything. I am deeply grateful for your wisdom and your battle-tested friendship through the years. I also want to extend a special thanks to all of my law clerks, many of whom are here today, who have carved out time and space to accompany me on this professional journey. I am especially grateful to Jennifer Gruda, who has been by my side since nearly the outset of my time on the bench and has promised, has promised not to leave me as we take this last big step. <laughs> to the many other friends that I have had the great good fortune to have made throughout the years, from my neighborhood growing up, from Miami Palmetto Senior High School, and especially the debate team. <laughs> From my days at Harvard College, where I met my indefatigable and beloved roommates, Lisa Fairfax, Nina Coleman Simmons, and Antoinette Sequera Coakley, they are truly my sisters. To my time at Harvard Law School and the many professional experiences that I've been blessed to have since graduation, thank you. I have too many friends to name, but please know how much you've meant to me and how much I have appreciated the smiles, the hugs, and the many atta girls that have propelled me <laughs> forward to this day. Finally, I'd like to give special thanks to the White House staff and the special assistants who provided invaluable assistance in helping me to navigate the confirmation process. My trusted Sherpa, Senator Doug Jones, was an absolute godsend. <laughs> he was an absolute godsend. He's not only the best storyteller you'd ever want to meet, but also unbelievably popular on the Hill, which helped a lot. <laughs> I'm also standing here today in no small part due to the hard work of the brilliant folks who interact with the legislature and other stakeholders on behalf of the White House including Louisa Terrell, Rima Doden, Tona Boyd, Minion Moore, Ben LeBalt, and Andrew Bates. <laughs> I am also particularly grateful for the awe-inspiring leadership of White House Counsel Dana Remus. <laughs> <laughs> of Paige Herwig, where is Paige? <laughs> and Ron Klain. They led an extraordinarily talented team of White House staffers in the Herculean effort that was required to ensure that I was well prepared for the rigors of this process and in record time. Thank you all. Thank you as well to the many, many kind-hearted people from all over this country and around the world who have reached out to me directly in recent weeks with messages of support. I have spent years toiling away in the relative solitude of my chambers with just my law clerks in isolation, 
So it's been somewhat overwhelming in a good way to recently be flooded with thousands of notes and cards and photos expressing just how much this moment means to so many people. The notes that I've received from children are particularly cute and especially meaningful because more than anything, they speak directly to the hope and promise of America. It has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we've made it. We've made it, all of us, all of us. And, and our children are telling me that they see now more than ever that here in America, anything is possible. They also tell me that I'm a role model, which I take both as an opportunity and as a huge responsibility. I am feeling up to the task primarily because I know that I am not alone. I am standing on the shoulders of my own role models, generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity, but who got up every day and went to work believing in the promise of America showing others through their determination and, yes, their perseverance that good, good things can be done in this great country. From my grandparents on both sides, who had only a grade school education but instilled in my parents the importance of learning, to my parents who went to racially segregated schools growing up and were the first in their families to have the chance to go to college. I am also ever buoyed by the leadership of generations past who helped to light the way, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Justice Thurgood Marshall, and my personal heroine, Judge Constance Baker Motley. They and so many others did the heavy lifting that made this day possible. And for all of the talk of this historic nomination and now confirmation, I think of them as the true path breakers. I am just the very lucky first inheritor of the dream of liberty and justice for all. To be sure, I have worked hard to get to this point in my career, and I have now achieved something far beyond anything my grandparents could have possibly ever imagined. But no one does this on their own. The path was cleared for me so that I might rise to this occasion. And in the poetic words of Dr. Maya Angelou, I do so now while bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. So as I take on this new role, I strongly believe that this is a moment in which all Americans can take great pride. We have come a long way toward perfecting our union. In my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation 
to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it is an honor, the honor of a lifetime, for me to have this chance to join the court, to promote the rule of law at the highest level, and to do my part to carry our shared project of democracy and equal justice under law forward into the future. Thank you again, Mr. President and members of the Senate, for this incredible honor. <laughs> Judge Katanji Brown Jackson delivering a powerful and emotional speech, embracing this moment in history that she is making, thanking not just her family, but the people who came before her, the women on whom she stands on their shoulders, saying very clearly, we've made it. Talking about how in her family, it took one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court. Referencing, of course, her judicial perspective, the way that she will serve when she does take that position, take that seat on the Supreme Court in a few months. But clearly, nodding to this incredible moment for her and for so many uh, men and women across this country. Again, making history as the first female, black female justice to sit on the Supreme Court. Uh, the president saying it's a powerful thing when people can see themselves in others. And that has been the theme of this, of this day here on the South Lawn of the White House so far. Let's bring in NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Walker. And Kristen, you could see the emotion on Judge Jackson's face. She wiped tears multiple times as the president and the vice president were speaking and then took that microphone and delivered essentially a message to women and girls who look like her across this country that this is possible. You're absolutely right, Allie, and I think you highlight the key point here. This was the most emotional that we have ever seen Judge Jackson. Uh, she was quite unflappable during her confirmation hearings. But today, she spoke in deeply personal terms about what this moment means to her, but what it means in the arc of history of this country. And she made it very clear she does not believe that she would be here if it weren't for those who came before her, if it weren't for all of her family, friends, and community who has rallied around her. She quoted Maya Angelou uh, and, of course, talked about, as you said, that it has been one generation from segregation to the Supreme Court, becoming incredibly emotional when she delivered that line. She thanked, of course, her husband, saying she couldn't do this without him, and her daughters calling being their mother the greatest joy of her life. Hallie, and those are the types of comments that you would expect, but I think it's important to underscore she thanked a long list of people who helped her throughout this confirmation process, including junior staffers here at the White House by name. And that really, I think, stood out to a lot of people here. In fact, one of the onlookers made that very point to me, how notable it was that she was thanking everyone who had helped her through this confirmation process. So this was a chance for her to mark this moment, this historic moment, but also to thank those who made this moment possible. And it struck me, Hallie, when she said, we have made it. Uh, she got a standing ovation when she said that. President Biden taking every inch of this victory lap today. This yeah. is a campaign promise kept, as you and I started talking about. I thought it was notably talked about the very heated confirmation hearing, referring to some of the exchanges as, quote, verbal abuse. He talked about the anger, the, quote, vile, baseless assertions that were made during that confirmation hearing. And that is notable because I think that you can anticipate similar messages from him, from other Democrats out on the campaign trail. Of course, this does come against the backdrop of a midterm election year. But he praised those three Republicans who supported Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson as well. And Hallie, I would just make one final point. So much of what we heard today from the 
the vice president, from the president, from Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, was the fact that this moment is historic, but it's significant for the generations to come because now little girls of all colors, of all backgrounds, they say can look up and see themselves in her. And I can tell you, I've been speaking to law students here at American University in Washington, D.C., who said that very same thing to me, that sentiment that now they believe they can do anything. Hallie? Our chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker, on the South Lawn. You heard Judge Jackson there referencing, as she said, the thousands of cards and pictures and notes that she's received, especially from young people across this country in recent weeks as this process has unfolded. Let me bring back NBC News Washington correspondent, Yamiche Alcindor. And it was, it was striking, Yamiche, to hear her quote Maya Angelou, I am the dream and the hope of a, sl of a slave, on the South Lawn of the White House, as she is just weeks away from ascending, formally and officially, to be sworn in as a Supreme Court justice of the United States. This was Judge Jackson, soon to be Justice Jackson, leaning into the history of this moment. Um, her friends have told me that she was someone who, even when she was in college, wanted people to say her name right and wanted people to make sure that they knew that, they, that this was an African history, an African heritage that she was carrying with this name. And when she quoted Maya Angelou, saying that I am the dream and the hope of the slave, she also said no one gets here on their own, saying that she is an inheritor of the fact that America can be a place where all things are possible. Um, she talked also about the idea that there are a number of people who helped her, and that she had these heroes of history that she was looking toward, including Constance Baker Motley, who she, who she shares a birthday with, um, that woman being the first black woman ever appointed to a federal judicial appointment. Um, Judge Jackson here was really making sure that she was getting personal and really making sure that she was talking to so many women who see her as an inspiration. Of course, as you, you and Kristen pointed out, she said, we've made it, and she said, all of us. And there's no question that she was talking about all of the little girls, especially the little black girls who are watching her and saying, I can do this now. I can dream of being on the Supreme Court. I can dream of being on the high, the, the nation's highest court in the land. I also thought it was it was striking that she talked specifically by name about her friends. I've talked to the, some of them, Antoinette Coakley in particular. She, ch she said her name um, at the White House talking about someone who predicted that she would be at this moment here. So she was also very careful to talk about sort of the personal people who have helped her along the way. That was really critical, and all of the people that I talked to say that's exactly who her character is. I also thought it was interesting that President Biden, he was praising her by saying she was both calm and poised, that she persevered and persevered with joy. This was the president, in some ways, leaning in on the themes that other people who know her um, recognize in her, saying that she's someone with dignity and also someone who was made for this moment. You heard her really, Yamish, embracing this moment that she's in. We've talked about what this means for her personally, but let me bring in our justice correspondent, Pete Williams, to talk about professionally, Pete, what her life looks like, right, between now and the next Supreme Court term. Because as we've said, we call her Judge Jackson because she is not yet officially a Supreme Court justice. She is soon to be Justice Jackson. She will not step into the court until after Justice Breyer formally steps down. Tell us what we can expect out of her and what her life looks like over the next, let's say, six months or so. Yeah, lots of uh, history made here today. This tradition of welcoming newly confirmed Supreme Court nominees back to the White House is a relatively recent one in our history. And this one was different in so many ways, not least of which is that she didn't take an oath of office today. And she can't do that until Justice Breyer steps down. But one thing she'll have is a huge advantage over many recent arrivals at the Supreme Court. She'll have the whole summer to do her homework, because this is the earliest arrival for a Supreme Court nominee in 50 50 years. Only Stephen Breyer comes even close. He got there a month later than she will. So many of them don't get there until just before the term starts or when it's already underway. So she's going to she's got to have a decision right away, Hallie, decide whether to stay on the Court of Appeals. If she does, there's the potential that if she rules on a case that's appealed to the Supreme Court, she'd have to step down and recuse from that. So does she want to run that risk or will she step down now and spend her time getting ready to take her two oaths of offices to become a justice in late June or early July and then start all the homework on the thousands of cases that pile up over the summer, deciding whether the Supreme Court will take those cases and reading in on the ones the court will already has already taken and that she'll have to make decisions on when the new term begins on the first Monday in October.
NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams. Pete, thank you so much. That's it for our coverage here today. There's going to be a lot more tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt of this historic moment at the White House. And of course, on our streaming channel, NBC News Now. I'm Hallie Jackson. For all of us here at NBC News, have a good day.